Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. We have a very exciting discussion uh, today. So um, uh, I appreciate uh, all of you being here on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, my name is Fahad Aziz and I will be moderating this session. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Open Silicon Valley for hosting us and for organizing these events. I was just told this morning that uh, we have uh, registration from uh, 11 countries and uh, we have, uh, we're gonna make, we're gonna uh, having this event live on Facebook. And it just made me realize this is gonna be a serious cake. So I need to find a jacket and wear one. So I'm here a little bit more formal for today's discussion. Um, so Silicon Valley has been organizing these webinars uh, for some time now. And uh, if you haven't uh, got a chance to attend any of those, we have all the recordings uh, on the YouTube channel. I highly encourage you to, uh, to watch them and also share with your friends and families. Each one of them uh, were as exciting as it could be and more informative for us. So please to attend them if you haven't seen them. They, we have the recordings up there. Few housekeeping items before we get started. Okay, so we would uh, request you to keep your line on mute. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, post them on the Q&A on the Zoom channel. We will be checking those uh, questions and towards the end of the session, we have 15 minutes where we're gonna take all these questions and ask our guests to answer them. If you also have any suggestions or any comments, you know, you can uh, post them on the Zoom Q&A or just you can email it to us. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because uh, I just want you to meet with the guests. So, um, briefly introducing myself, uh, my name is uh, Fahad Aziz. I'm a co-founder of a healthcare startup, Care Merge. My background is in technology for over 20 years now. Uh, I, I got a bit fortunate in the very early in my career. Uh, the first startup that I joined when I was in college uh, became uh, uh, successful and uh, from six people that we started to went up to uh, uh, went uh, did IPO and went uh, uh, public on Nasdaq. So for me, at an age of such an early st uh, stage in my life, I thought this is very easy to do, and uh, if uh, because that's all I have seen, so I thought it's very easy to build companies and went go public. So after I left that organization, I tried to do a few startups and they all failed, and that's when the reality hit that uh, uh, it's not as easy as it uh, appeared. Um, then I decided to quit my job. 10 years into doing jobs, I quit my job and started uh, this company, Care Merge. Uh, it's been a few years now. The vision was to uh, help uh, aging population. As you know, when we get older, we need more care. And to provide more care, we need more people get involved. And coordinating the care among all those stakeholders is a bit of a challenge. So we decided to solve this problem. And it's been an interesting journey. Since then, we, we are now serving over 100,000 seniors. Uh, in U.S. and we have raised 20 million in, in this uh, in this journey and uh, are growing since then. Um, so these are very difficult times um, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, on an individual level, there's uh, there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of anxiety. And uh, even for startups, uh, it's not easy, you know, uh, to be able to keep your customers, to able able to get new customers. Uh, it's it's very difficult. Um, so is this on? So um, last, and I, I keep track of the investments in healthcare and startups. And so last week on TechCrunch, I saw uh, this news about Overjet uh, closing uh, and making an announcement about their round. And it was very exciting because after a couple of weeks, we saw something uh, on, on the side where healthcare startup such, at such early stage was able to uh, close such a big round. And when I started to look into it, uh, uh, it, I was pleasantly surprised and excited to see that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, founded by a female founder and uh, she, she is from Pakistan. So, and the days following that announcement, uh, my uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, feed was filled up. Everyone uh, in Pakistan and all the media started to own it and they felt that this is their success. And not just because they saw a another startup that was able to raise money but also they felt that you know there's a hope in these difficult times if you have a good idea if you want to solve a real problem uh 
despite the crisis, you will still be able to close money and you'll still be able to convince the investors to help you out. So I'm very excited to uh, have uh, Warda Inam join us today. Uh, she is the uh, founder of Overjet. Um, and uh, without any more, uh, without any further delay, uh, let me ask Warda to introduce herself and uh, talk a bit about her journey, how, where she started and how she came to this point where she was able to make that announcement. Warda. Hi, Farhad. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, and thank you for everybody to join uh, this discussion. Uh, my name is Radha Enam. Uh, as uh, Fad mentioned, I'm the CEO, founder of uh, Overjet. And uh, for me, the uh, you know I was born and brought up in Pakistan, uh, and then uh, went off to as I was interested in physics and math. Went on, uh, off to uh, GIK for my uh, undergrad. Uh, after doing my undergrad, uh, I came to uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, so. Uh, came to MIT for my master's and PhD, completed that, did a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT in the computer science and artificial intelligence lab, and then uh, worked at a startup in Silicon Valley and Boston. Uh, it was called QBio, working in biomedical imaging, and then uh, started Overjet uh, primarily to solve uh, the variation of diagnosis and care that exists in the industry. Great. So Warda, if you don't mind, I want to take you back where it all started. So we were having this conversation yesterday as you're preparing for this webinar. And one of the questions I asked you was that, how did you get so much interested in physics and robotics back in Pakistan? And uh, talk a little bit about that and your experience uh, while you were at GIK. Yes, I think uh, for me, you know, uh, I've Probably from the the beginning, uh, probably I was just good at physics and math, and I think that's why you know the interest came in it as well. But also, uh, I think I got interested in engineering primarily because of the ability to create, uh, build something that has never existed. Building something of your of your own is uh, pretty fascinating if uh, once you do it. And I think uh, uh, th that is what uh, intrigued me about engineering. And uh, I. I I ended up at GIK after, uh, uh, you know, after high school, primarily because one of my uh, uh, one of my friends, his brother had gone to GIK, uh, and uh, he, you know, one of his brother had gone to GIK, and another brother had gone to MIT. So uh, he basically said, you know, this is the best college if you wanted to go to uh, a college in Pakistan. Uh, so I applied there. I applied to a few other universities as well, and uh, ended up uh, in, in GIK. Great. So for, for the audience, you know, uh, as many of you know that uh, GIK has a very interesting setting because it's not in one of the major cities. It's far from Islamabad, probably like two to three hours drive. And uh, it was built, the campus was built in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so one of the uh, requirements is that you have to stay in a hostel for four years while you're studying there. And you uh, probably you can only come on weekends or uh, when the days are off. So tell us how, how was that experience for you? Uh, how many other uh, female students were there? And if you can share some stories about uh, uh, being in a hostel. Yeah, so GIK is an interesting experience. Uh, I think anybody who's been there, uh, you know, can say we have very, uh, I think we, we, we grow very close together uh, because of the experiences that we go through. Uh, and being uh, secluded, I think, has its advantages. Of course, has its disadvantages as well. But the uh, but, but but the fr friendships you develop in such an environment, I think, are very very strong. Um, uh, so we were about five five percent uh, in some batches, probably sometimes even lower than that, uh, female. Uh, and uh, mostly they were guys. So in our batch, we were more than 300. There were more than 300 students. Out of that, we were about 15, 16 girls. Uh, and uh, we stayed, there was one hostel, which was a girl, the girls hostel. Uh, and, uh, and that's where we mostly spent our time uh, and, uh, you know, and at the uh, duck shop. Uh, so there was one shop that you actually went to. Um, and, uh, but I think for me, it was a great experience. I think uh, at that time I, you know, developed my love for engineering, but also uh, love for robotics. 
Uh, and uh, I was fascinated by robotics, the ability for machines to uh, do stuff that uh, you know either humans don't want to do or humans can't do that well. So I got into uh, rescue robotics uh, primarily and, uh, and ended up building uh, a lab of my own. Uh, I was very fortunate in, in an environment where in GIK where uh, you you know as even as a sophomore you have the ability to uh, you know if you have a good idea you can actually create it and I think that's very rare um, in uh, you know uh, for uh, uh, for GIK itself uh, but I, you know I went to the, uh, my the dean of the, uh, of my faculty and told him that I was interested in robotics there was no robotics lab. And I said, you know, I wanted to set up a lab and he gave me an office space. He said there was a computer. So we, you know, uh, looked through the um, a, a storeroom, found a computer, put it together, uh, found parts uh, from, uh, uh, you know, some were from fax machines, others were uh, whatever we could find uh, in, in the in the campus. We put uh, together our first uh, uh, robot and, and then from there we were interested in uh, uh, like autonomous and semi-autonomous robots, so started raising funding, building uh, the robot, and uh, uh, and it was uh, fascinating to actually build a team together and end up uh, representing GIK and Pakistan in Austria. So we were the first team ever representing there. So it, it has been a, uh, I would say, looking back, that you know, those are the things that I remember the most. Uh, spending a lot of time in, in the labs with friends who you were all interested in uh, doing something that we were learning uh, and, uh, and and building something that uh, we were proud of uh, at the end. That's awesome. You know, what the, um, as, as I'm uh, listening to you about, you know, how you, how passionate you were about uh, this robotic and uh, you sort of drove this in the, at GIK and uh, started to convince your professors and, uh, and make them uh, make the resources available to you. You know, I think uh, this is this stands true for many institutions back in Pakistan. But, you know, if the students are really determined, they really want to do something, the resources are not so difficult to become available. You know, as in many cases, even the institutions are willing to step up and provide those resources if they see there's so much determination and passion. Okay, okay. great. So from there, um, so we you, you undergrad you completed your undergraduate from GIK. And uh, then you came to Boston. Talk about your experience, how you ended up at MIT, and how that, that, that experience was like. So I think, uh, you know, in my naivety, I, I applied to uh, a few colleges, uh, which I you know, wanted really to get into. I didn't apply to many. Uh, I applied to, I think, four. Uh, and one of them was MIT. Uh, and just before that, I think, uh, uh, a friend of mine I, again told me that you know if you wanted to get to MIT you want you should have research experience. So then I said okay I need a research paper, uh, and uh, you know that summer I wrote my first research paper, pres got it got it presented in uh, uh, you know it was in a uh, and got accepted in a conference, and I think that was one of the things that led to it because you know having. Uh, uh, at least some of these schools, if you, you want to do a research degree there, you need research experience. Um, and uh, uh, I think that uh, played a part. Uh, and uh, that was also done uh, at, uh, I got an internship in uh, Ireland um, in robotics. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the professor there also helped out. So I think the, 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 um, um, recommendation letters that the professors at GIK and and my internship uh, letters that uh, were written, I think that that really uh, put me in the position to come to MIT, uh, and uh, you know, and I right after college, I I came to MIT. So, did you have a mentor or someone who who was walking you through this process, or you figured it out yourself how to apply, how to publish the research paper? So I uh, so yeah no there wasn't and if you actually look at my research paper I'm the sole author which is not a good thing you should have a you know you're usually the last author is a professor uh, but for me you know not knowing not uh, not having the guidance there uh, of uh, you know uh, that you you know you have to have a, a research PI uh, I basically you know 
had this goal of uh, getting my research published so that I could, you know, have the information needed for uh, getting into, you know, good colleges, good research colleges. So I think uh, there was a little lack of um, uh, guidance there, uh, primarily because, you know, not a lot of people had got into this, these colleges before. Uh, and I think that's where uh, now I, I think with the amount of, uh, you know, we, we, we did have, of course, internet and everything, but I think it's, it's getting more and more accessible uh, and uh, this information is getting more uh, easy on what, what is needed to get into these colleges. So I, I think uh, that's becoming uh, much more, people are getting much more aware than, than at least we were when we were applying. So it's a pretty straightforward process. You know, the, the, everything is on the web. You just follow the process, see what the requirements are, talk to the people that uh, or students that are already there and just follow the steps. And uh, you know, there are good chances, you know, if you're determined, you will qualify and get into uh, colleges. If not in MIT, the 10 or top 20 other colleges. So what now, let's, uh, let's go from this experience. So let's talk about uh, your family. You know, uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, very critical in, in any journey, let alone this one, is that support that you get from your family and your friends. So talk us about it, you know, oh, for your family to send you to a hostel for four years, or your family to send you to MIT. How was that experience? How much supportive they were? Uh, did they change their mind in the middle when they saw something uh, positive coming out or was it like this since the beginning? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, some parents have been uh, very supportive from the beginning. Uh, I think uh, because, especially because my sisters uh, were pretty smart, I think they, uh, they thought I was, uh, I needed a little more help than they needed. Uh, so they've been very supportive from the beginning and, and letting me do what I wanted to do. So, uh, uh, you know, in school, I was, uh, I was mainly focused in, 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 on sports rather than studies, and that was okay with them. Uh, but in college, I got more interested in, uh, in studies in general, and they were very supported there. But I think, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to, I, I think I mentioned this to you uh, as well yesterday that, uh, for for the particular for for my startup Overjet, my mom was the first person to uh, put money in. So the first check was written by my parents, uh, and uh, and I think that uh, tells you how supportive they are in uh, in whatever I'm doing. Uh, and it's not about whether it's a startup or whether it's uh, I'm uh, I'm joining uh, a, a certain company. It's about you know doing what you really love to do. And I think that's been their at least uh, philosophy since the beginning. Well, getting a check from your mother, I'm sure puts a lot more pressure to make this uh, gig successful. So now let's oh, talk absolutely. about this venture. Well, I got uh, my first check from my father-in-law, so I can feel <laughs> the pressure. Well, they've been very supportive. Um, so let's talk about Overjet now. Okay, so you are finishing up your uh, PhD at MIT and uh, you got a chance to work with a startup for a few months. Why didn't you just pursue that startup? Uh, and you told me that it was doing very well and they were growing. Why not just continue working with them and uh, enjoy the benefits of success? Why leave them and start something uh, from ground up? Yeah, so, uh, so while I was doing my postdoc at CSAIL, I got recruited at a startup called QBio. Uh, it was uh, founded by a third time founder. His last company was worth $3 billion. So, you know, it was a, a very uh, different experience where the founder was the founder was very well connected, and the startup. Uh, you know, we were solving a huge problem there as well, uh, which was in the MRI world uh, and uh, helping uh, create a more precision medicine as well as making MRI more lower cost and accessible to everyone. Uh, and uh, the the founder himself, you know, got a great team together. So uh, there were PhD, uh, MIT professors, uh, almost everyone had a PhD was working on, on my team. Uh, and uh, it was Silicon and Boston based. Uh, and I think they recently raised like $40 million. So, the, you know, the company was doing pretty well. Um, and, uh, uh, and I, I think, you know, I, I, I spent a little more than a year there. Uh, but what I really, uh, was interested in was actually I got interested in dentistry. I went to the dentist, uh, got overdiagnosed, 
uh, got treatments that I did not need and something did not feel right. So I asked the dentist to uh, share uh, the, uh, my x-rays with me. Uh, I started looking at x-rays. How do you read x-rays? What, what am I seeing? And I realized that, you know, there was a lot of aggressive uh, diagnosis that I had gone uh, 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 was made. So I uh, basically asked for second opinions and realized that, uh, you know, everybody was disagreeing with the, uh, the particular dentist. Uh, so I, uh, I, so I, that basically got me very, very interested in the industry and seeing whether, uh, you know, technology can help solve it. And uh, I started looking more into it and started delving deeper. And that's when, when I realized that I was less focused on what I was doing uh, at my uh, current startup uh, uh, that I was working at. And I was actually more interested in whatever, uh, you know, I was thinking of next, which was in dentistry. So I, I left my uh, job and, and started looking at, you know, how can we use technology to improve the standard of care in dentistry? So that's how the transition happened. It was more of, you know, uh, not not paying too much attention at work and, and fo- being starting to get more focused on this problem. So, um, so did you uh, one day woke up and say, I think I have a problem and I think I can solve this problem and put in your resignation and next day start working on it. Is that, is that how the process looked like? Uh, not, not, no, it wasn't overnight. Uh, it was basically, you know, I was, I was doing pretty well at the other startup as well. I, you know, my equity has uh, had grown significantly. I was promoted uh, many times there. So in a very, very short time. Uh, so I knew that, you know, there was, uh, and I was, I started leading the, uh, one of the offices there as well. So, uh, I, I was, I was doing well there. Um, and, but there was, a you know, the company had just raised another round, you know, it was doing well. So I, I wanted to, I waited for uh, that round to happen, uh, so that there was no, uh, as, as I had built the, the prototype for it, uh, I wanted that to be demoed, you know, uh, for the, uh, the company to raise the money. So it, it was a few months. Uh, that uh, I spent with the, the company while this idea was brewing, uh, so that uh, you know the, that transition happened uh, nicely. The company did not suffer for, uh, because of me leaving. And once uh, we ended up raising, after that I actually left. So it was a uh, um, it, it, took, it took a few months from the initial kind of like I, I would like to work on this to actually uh, actually leaving. Great. Um, so, um, and when you left, I'm sure the organization that you left weren't too unhappy because you left them at a very good, uh, uh, point. They have closed their round and they have, uh, you have delivered what were expected. You know, one of the experiences that I had was that when I decided to leave my job, I was working there for many years. And when I went to, uh, the founder and said, Hey, I have decided to do a startup and quit this job. Um, uh, the feedback that I got, which I wasn't expecting was that, listen, Fahad, uh, that's a great idea that you want to do and pursue. Uh, we will support you. Take everything that you have, all the devices, computers that you need. And just remember, if it doesn't work out, if it fails, you can always come back and we'll be here to uh, onboard you. You know, and this is something, you know, that's very important because uh, when you leave your organization for another organization, it's very different than leaving your organization to do a startup. Because your current organization really values what you're trying to do and the the uh, the fire that you want to get into, and in most cases they support you. Okay, so that's just something I just wanted to bring up because many of our friends uh, were working, always think about quitting, but then they are concerned that you know if they fail, what's going to happen? They may not be able to find another job. Okay, great. So uh, let's talk about this funding. You know, uh, I have done these rounds few times in my startup. And uh, from the outside, it looks like closing a round is a huge achievement. But uh, as many of the entrepreneurs know, that the closing a round is just one of the milestones that you achieve, and there's and it opens up, unlocks many other oppor- uh, many other milestones that now you have to do. I I, I was telling you yesterday that uh, the whole process can take up to four to six months, and you, you probably know this well. Uh, and uh, during this time, there's anxiety, there's stress. Up until the day that you get the funding in your account, you don't know what can happen. You know, they can change their mind and something crazy can happen, right? The day you get the funds in your account is probably the only day that you're happy and excited and you decide to go and celebrate. But when you wake up next day, 
you know, now you have much more things to worry about, where to spend the money, who to hire. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, the commitments that you have made during your investor pitch, how are you going to actually achieve them? And uh, despite all the fun, fear and, and excitement in the market, as a founder, you have more things to worry about now, right? So a couple of things I want to ask you over here. Um, you, uh, when you started doing this fundraising, it must be sometime in January, February, because if it takes four or five months, uh, uh, this is the time period that you would have started talking to investors. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. So uh, I had this goal in mind that I'm going to fundraise in a quarter. So mm -hmm. it went to, and I, and I told everyone from the beginning, you know, we, we, we're raising this quarter. Uh, and uh, I, uh, so uh, from, and it, it takes, you know, from the term sheet all, uh, to the close as well, it takes about a month. So in total, you know, it was about four months. Uh, it took us to close around uh, and get the, and, uh, and get the final paperwork done. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, that's also for people, if, you know, uh, if anybody is fundraising at this time or thinking of fundraising, I would say like really time bounding it because uh, uh, it's, it's effort that's going towards, you know, as far the, uh, you know it's going towards uh, not, not directly in building a business. You know, a lot of effort is going, talking to people who are, who are not going to invest in you, but you know, you're, uh, you're revising your pitch and it's getting better and better every time you do it. Uh, and, and you're getting more clarity in what you're doing. But other than that, it's not, you know, these are not customers that you're talking to. Uh, and it might lead to a customer, but it's very indirect. So I think for me, it was uh, really time bounding that uh, very, uh, 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 and making sure that we raise quickly so that we can actually achieve what we really want to do. And as you pointed out, you know, fund fundraising is just a piece of it. You know, it's just the capital needed to actually do what you want to do. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we also started, you know, things were going well, all our, uh, 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 and there were uh, we were getting a lot of interest uh, th through this process, so we actually started uh, hiring people d during uh, it as well, knowing that we were going to close at that time. So it wasn't a you know a close, and then we st you know had to hire ridiculously fast. Uh, we kind of started ramping up during uh, it as well, uh, knowing that this is going to happen. So you know a little more risk than you would take, but I think we had good supporters who said you know uh, we we we're in uh, no matter what. Well, lots of confidence. <laughs> um, you know, if you look back uh, uh, three, four months and sometimes January, February, the mindset of investors was starting to change. The mood was changing. They, they were seeing what's coming and uh, we saw the stock, uh, stock markets go down. Investors were trying to pull out cash. It must have been a daunting task for you to close this round and I just want to congratulate you for doing that in such difficult times. Okay, so now the round is closed. You have cash in the bank. Tell us what's the top of the mind things for you uh, for next few months. What are the things that keeps you up all night? So I think for, for us, that you know, uh, has been uh, getting good people on board. Uh, so we we hired some really spectacular people this this month, uh, uh, and uh, you know there are a few people who will be joining us later this month. So we we were able to hire pretty well, I think. Uh, but you know that that you know while you're hiring it's uh, uh, again time being spent on hiring when the people aren't in the company that means a lot more work is created also some of our uh, pilots went into production as well, and our pilots were getting completed so there was a lot of uh, work that was uh, happening as well uh, so i think uh, uh, our, our customers didn't care whether we had fundraised or whatever uh, had happened so i think uh, and we, we get, uh, you know there were deadlines that we had to meet and have to meet still so i think for us uh, it's been a a few busy months and uh, and you know in the next few months it's it's going to be very busy as well uh, but also you know as covid um, uh, hit uh, the landscape dental landscape completely changed uh, we weren't impacted too badly with it uh, because uh, our major customers were insurance companies but our minor customers were practices but practices got impacted uh, really uh, significantly and uh, the, there was a lot of um, uncertainty in the dental industry and I think that was uh, added to uh, um, you know stress on what, what was happening uh, it, now I think you know with practices reopening uh, I think at least not not in the east, uh, the coasts, but in in the rest of the U.S., it's gotten back to about eighty percent in, in uh, um, the production itself. Uh, so things are getting back to normal, and uh, the the stress level in the dental industry has reduced significantly. So I think in general, it was 
you know, the, the fundraise, closing of contracts to uh, COVID hitting, uh, a lot was happening and has been happening uh, for us uh, for the past few months. Yeah, great. Um, so let's talk about the uh, applications of AI uh, in healthcare. Um, the, uh, you know, if you look two years back or three years back when, uh, or maybe a little, uh, go a little further back, um, there was a lot more uh, excitement and promise uh, of AI. And uh, I did a research and published it on Forbes uh, in 2017. And I spoke with a lot of healthcare leaders. And uh, there were a lot of things that they were expecting that AI will do and solve. And maybe all the biggest problems in the world will be solved by AI. That was the impression a few years back. Uh, now we have realized the potential of AI. We understand you know, what it can do, what it cannot do. Can you talk us through some of the key applications that you believe that the AI will solve in healthcare? Yeah, so I think uh, one thing to remember here is, uh, so AI is a, is a loaded word. Um, in AI, there are particular areas uh, and from those, uh, deep learning is, has been the one which is, uh, has caused AI to become the buzzword it has been. And pr primarily that is uh, neural networks, uh, which are deeper uh, and training them uh, with data. Uh, uh, so using supervised learning, uh, that has basically propelled AI to what it is. And what led to it was the um, compute getting cheaper and cheaper. So with hardware getting cheaper to do a lot of computation, we were able to then build bigger models to train those models with a lot of data and having that ability to uh, use a lot of data for the training. Uh, and uh, the results were just fascinating. So with ImageNet coming in 2012, from 2012 to now, there has been this increase uh, in uh, the, 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 the word itself, but also uh, the, the applications to which uh, deep learning had been applied to. Uh, so primarily, I think deep learning, there's a lot to go, you know, with supervised learning, then, you know, we're now seeing the rise of unsupervised, uh, so weekly supervised now, uh, finally, we should see some rise of unsupervised or, uh, or semi-supervised learning as well. So I think in general, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the, the uptake has been more so towards deep learning, supervised learning, and for supervised learning, you require a lot of data. And that means uh, you're learning through examples. So anywhere that you can actually have very good examples being given to the AI models, you'll get good results out of it. So it's uh, the models are learning through the examples themselves. So that means uh, anything that uh, that is based on images. Uh, so computer vision has seen a lot of um, go, uh, good uh, uh, results that, ha that have happened. So whether it's you know your selfies or other images that you've taken or it's medical imaging and, and especially uh, in in healthcare, you know your your normal images are good for say skin or other conditions that, that you might be taking. So your photographs in general, uh, and and your radiographs, your ex, uh, ex, uh, your X-ray CTEs, etc., are are good for other in looking internally into your body. All those areas are ripe for innovation. We've just you know touched still the tip of the iceberg. Uh, where a lot of uh, a lot of it is focused on triage, so finding things quicker than a dent, uh, sorry a, 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 a physician might, uh, and we're we're literally uh, you know we haven't solved a lot of problems in there yet. Uh, the other is natural language processing. That's where the note taking comes in. Um, so you know uh, we we've gotten very very good at it. Whether it's your Siri or your Alexa, but you know having more specialized. Uh, um, uh, uh, systems built in for healthcare, particularly. And then you have all your administrative tasks, the same repetitive tasks that are done again and again, which, uh, which, in, which is towards more robotic process automation. Uh, and that can, uh, you know, AI can play a major role because there are a lot of examples that it can see and see what the results would be and get the feedback that's needed to train these models. So I would say any of these are still, you know, still in the beginning stages. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, go good work done, but I think the next five to 10 years, we're really going to see all these things getting implemented and really changing uh, how it works. But then you have your, you know, other stuff and Pav, you can probably talk uh, a lot about that as well. You know, areas where uh, AI just doesn't work. So applying uh, AI to, you know, you, uh, you know, having a sense, uh, you know, 
where data is being collected, so sensors, et cetera, it's, it works, but your physical objects, you know, uh, AI might not be the, the best solution for it. So I uh, would love to, if you, you know, if you had some thoughts about it as well, would love to hear those. Yeah, you know, uh, I shared this example with you yesterday. You know, there was a huge uh, partnership between GE and Intel for five years back, and they put together these sensors uh, in, a, in an apartment of a older adult. And the whole idea was that, you know, if there is a fall, if someone is sleeping longer than they should, is spending more time in the uh, washroom than they should, uh, these sensors would create alerts and notify the nurses or caregivers so they can go and uh, help them out. Uh, it was a big investment, big partnership. They created a big uh, fuss about it, but uh, it ended up being a failure. And the reason why it failed was because it was creating more alerts than it should be. Uh, and there was no intelligence over there to figure out which alerts are false alarms and which are not. As a result, now caregivers have to go into the apartment every 10 minutes because there was something happening. And if they don't go, there could be a real situation and they just missed it and could become a compliance. So there was excitement, but it was not very well thought and it created more problems for end users than actually solved. And that's why, you know, uh, and that's one challenge. The other biggest challenge in healthcare, uh, especially in the US has been the data. You know, these healthcare systems, um, these uh, technologies, they always had uh, uh, the right to own the data of the patients. So as much as they will tell you that, hey, you can get your data if you go to this portal and put your username and password. Uh, at the end of the day, they don't share the bigger data or data sets with uh, younger companies or with companies who are trying to build AI models. As a result of that, it's very difficult to train the models, very difficult to do that. Now, the good news is that all that is changing. In last year and this year, there has been uh, new regulations uh, that has been opposed by these tech companies, but they are coming in that will allow uh, the startups and young companies to be able to get access to data so they can train. So a lot of good things are happening uh, with AI and healthcare. And I think uh, if anything, this pandemic has put more attention, more investment uh, into healthcare, and we'll, we'll see some, some good outcomes uh, in months and years to come. This brings me to a very interesting question. So I was having this discussion with a few other people uh, last week, and they, they, they made this uh, statement and uh, I was starting to think about it after I left that conversation. They said, uh, I think AI failed us during this pandemic. You know, there was much more expectation that uh, AI will deliver and uh, we have situations like these, AI will take care of it, you know? But it apparently AI has not done much and we are back to the basic thing of collecting data and trying to create processes and all that. So, uh, and I don't agree with it and I know you don't agree with it. So tell us why you think AI is still uh, critical in dealing with this pandemic. Yeah, so I think uh, you know, uh, I think AI is thing some some role where it can. So of course, AI uh, or or deep learning is not the solution for uh, every problem. Uh, so it is playing a role in drug discovery, and I think it'll you know, the thing that will save us from all this is uh, a vaccine, which is going to uh, protect us hopefully. Uh, and AI is playing a big role in that. Uh, you know, uh, for a lot with, with a lot. For a lot of pharma companies, um, uh, in, but, but it, when, when it comes to your, uh, you know, uh, what's happening, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, trends, etc., and recognizing those, I think, uh, you know, what we've seen r right now has been unprecedented. Uh, so there are no examples that we can just feed in and and get uh, outputs out. So there is, uh, you know, our, so it's it's not really good at predicting what's going to happen uh, currently because we've never seen anything like that. So I think there is, uh, you know little uh, understanding of the fact that you know AI is in magic it's uh, it's basically learning from examples or behaviors that have happened in the past to see what's going to happen uh, and it has its limitations but also you know we came to uh, you know as, as human beings we have needs uh, whether it's eating food etc you can of course determine what food I would like uh, but you cannot make uh, uh, food uh, just by artificial intelligence, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, the physical uh, manufacturing needs to be there. So I think what we've realized, at least in COVID, is you know, manufacturing uh, and, uh, and supply chain is very, very crucial, and having that 
uh, you know, closer to uh, where the uh, where it's consumed is is better. Uh, and AI can help in you know the manufacturing piece of it, uh, and how do you manufacture better? But the actual manufacturing, the physical uh, act of it, uh, you know, would require better policies, better uh, 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 you know uh, uh, access to capital in in the area where where things are needed, uh, and changing uh, you know how uh, manufacturing happens. Uh, so I think. Uh, you know, it's not a, a, a magic bullet that, you know, you can shoot on it, everything, but understanding where it can really uh, have an impact and, and provide results which are better than anything else uh, uh, would, would be where, you know, a lot of data is involved. Right. And, you know, one of the key things uh, for AI uh, to be accurate is uh, uh, the, the patterns that uh, it finds in the data that's provided to it. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned yesterday in our conversation was that this whole COVID and uh, this pandemic uh, has, uh, we have not seen those patterns before. Maybe when we had the uh, flu pandemic, but we don't have the data from there. So for AI, it was, uh, it needed more time to learn. Uh, it needs some data coming in and that data will help us learn. And hopefully, you know, next time if uh, God forbid something like this happens, AI will be a little bit more prepared because it has seen those patterns uh, before. You know, and you know, in our everyday life, you know, we don't realize that uh, it's it's completely now. It's very difficult for us to live without AI apps, um, whether it's the YouTube recommendations or Netflix recommendations. Imagine uh, going into YouTube and not logging in. Uh, all the uh, videos that's showing up is are irrelevant. You know, um, or you have not done any search, it will not tell you anything, and you very soon you're just going to stop using it. So those things, and then you know the uh, the way it searches your pictures on your uh, photos on your cam on your phone, and being able to tell you, you know who who these pictures are for and all that stuff, you know it's just part of our daily living, you know, and it's getting smarter and smarter. So there's no reason it's not going to come into healthcare and make a huge impact. It's already there in many ways. Absolutely. Okay, so we have uh, 15 minutes. Um, uh, before we go into the uh, questions uh, that we have received uh, from our guests, um, what the you know, uh, you know, there are many people here who are who are who find you inspiring. Uh, they believe that you know you were bold to take these steps throughout your journey. Um, tell them you know why why were what what was driving you to this process. You know why? Why did you do all this stuff? Uh, why did you take so bold, so many bold steps and so many difficult decisions? Yeah, so I think uh, at least that comes to my you know philosophy of my life or thinking of like what's the purpose of uh, of life, uh, uh, and I think you know uh, 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 for me one of the most important things is uh, the having an impact, and the impact here means uh, improving people's lives. I think by me. Uh, existing, I, I uh, you know, I, there, I have some responsibility, uh, and which is to make sure that uh, I, I lead the world better than where I found it. Uh, and I think that's where what has driven me in, in terms uh, of uh, building uh, products which can help improve people's lives. And that has been, you know, fr from the beginning uh, uh, for me. And, and that's been a, you know, whatever I do, I, I, I you know, I could be spending time on anything. And if I'm spending time on something, I, I think it, it should be valuable for me to spend time on. So rather than just building, say, an app which uh, searches your photos, I'll prefer working on uh, uh, a healthcare app which uh, uh, triages the uh, you know the uh, important uh, patients so that uh, uh, you know more patients can get the right care and reduce suffering, improve quality of care. And I think that's at least what I believe in uh, and want to build uh, for the, the rest of my life. That's awesome. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I know we, we wish you all the best. Um, we have a few questions now that, uh, uh, that our participants have uh, asked. So let me start uh, with those questions. Uh, the, the first one I have is, uh, is about uh, how do you pivot as an engineer you know, you move from being a engineer uh, on to becoming a CEO. Do you think that there is a transitional path where you should go from being an engineer to become a product manager, uh, uh, be there for some time, and then go into CEO role, or you think it, it uh, it's okay to just jump into CEO? 
I think, uh, it, again, it depends on what you want to do um, and what you are good at doing, et cetera. So I think, and, and who your, you know, people are around you are. So for, for example, for me, uh, I could have taken either role. I could have taken the CTO role or the CEO role. Uh, my, one of my co-founders, uh, you know, or two of my, I have two co-founders, uh, I don't think any one of them could have taken the CEO role. So one of it was a gap was created and uh, from the three of us, you know, uh, the role, uh, I was more suited to take that role on. And, uh, and uh, my co-founder, he had, uh, he graduated in 2001 with his PhD. Uh, and has, uh, you know, he was director at uh, multinational companies, etc. And uh, ha and has a lot of uh, technical experience, uh, probably more, you know, definitely more than I, I do. So I think that was, uh, he took on that role and I, I took on the CEO role. And the, the question whether you have to go through the path of going from, um, you know, technical to product, uh, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think so. I think again, you know, you can do pretty much what you want to do if you uh, if you are willing to learn uh, what's needed to be successful at that role, and if you actually want to do that role. Uh, so you know, there there's no you know glamour in uh, any role in that sense if you don't like doing that role. So I would just say, you know, if if you want to be the CEO of your company, uh, you know, then learn what a you know what, what a good successful CEO looks like, and whether that's something you want to do as well. Right. So I would um, I have a slightly different thought on that. Uh, I think you know one needs to be very honest uh, to himself or herself and know what their uh, shortcomings are, what their strengths are. Not everyone is can uh, become a CEO, and if you do want to become a CEO, then you know identify what your gaps are, you know, and make sure that you fill them before you jump into that role. Because you're taking too much risk with the product, you're taking too much risk with the funding and all that stuff. Last thing you want to be dealing with is your ability to actually manage a team, ability to manage customers, and so on. So you know, I keep telling people, I keep telling people that you know, uh, it's very exciting to be a founder. It's very exciting to be a CEO, but it, there's a lot of responsibility that lies upon you. So please make sure that you have, you know, what it means and what in, it entails. Uh, you don't, uh, you don't take the ship in the wrong uh, direction. Okay, so we have one more question for you. This is from Reshma. She's asking how difficult it is to integrate patient data across different providers. Do you plan to utilize efficient data visualization tools? So um, the integration isn't too hard. So first is getting the data. Um, so. Uh, the good thing is it, uh, it's a little easier in dentistry than it is in, uh, you know, if you were trying to get it from a hospital system. Uh, but uh, for, for example, for us, we've integrated it into major patient management systems uh, so we can actually get data very easily. Uh, and the, the question is, you know, um, how do you show that data to the, the customers so that they can understand it? Here, our customers are dentists. So that means uh, they're not technical experts in that sense. So, you know, the uh, 3D graphs, et cetera, will not be the way to go. So, uh, you know, um, making them very simple, you know, gi giving them insights uh, into their data, but uh, in a very simple manner. And we have, you know, we, we have built visualization tools there and uh, and are using them uh, to, to show data data to the, our customers in the easiest way possible. Great. Okay, so we have a few more questions, Sam. So that's good. Um, is it critical to reach product market fit? How do you plan on going about that? So I think it's absolutely, you know, you need to reach, uh, if, you, if you want to be a VC backed company, you know, product market fit, where you can use that funds uh, is important. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are different, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the founder of Superhuman has done a, uh, written a very good article about that. If if anybody is interested in product and market fit, and what is it, you know, and he quantifies exactly what's needed, uh, and how do you see if you you've gotten it or not? At least for for us, uh, you know, the uh, at the stage we're at. Uh, we know there's a very strong need in the insurance industry for what we're building uh, and that we're seeing by the adoption of the technology being very, very quickly compared to any other technology that insurance companies adopt. Uh, so that gives us, you know, at least in a, uh, hope in the right direction or it, it's hope as well as, uh, you know, movement in the right direction. And uh, and in general, we are, you know, looking at, uh, uh, you know, where we are in product market fit and how, how can we improve it uh, as well. But, you know, it's going to be a, a journey for us. Great. 
Okay, we have another question uh, where Malik is asking, can overjet solution be applied in Pakistan? Yes, I think, uh, uh, I would say absolutely. Um, so I, I think uh, developing world countries, uh, you know, the, one of the goals of this technology is to provide standardized care. That means care whether, you know, you're getting it in the US or Pakistan, you should receive the, the high, highest quality care. So I think by, by um, definition, it's, it's meant for, uh, you know, especially developing countries to really uh, leapfrog and, uh, and provide uh, better care. There are some challenges with that. Uh, uh, you know, not, not a lot of data is collected usually uh, in, in a dental checkup. Uh, less data is collected than it's collected in the US and that you know, uh, reduces the impact. But as it gets to more preventive care and we start collecting more data, it, it will be useful. As well as currently, there are, there are hardly any oral radiologists in Pakistan. Uh, you know, in the US, there are only 200. Uh, so in Pakistan, there are some oral radiologists that are Pakistani. There are uh, very few uh, oral radiologists. I haven't heard of any uh, oral radiologists in Pakistan. So that means when you're talking about 3D scans, uh, no, nobody has the ability to read them. And that's where the technology can really uh, help out. Do they use the uh, same equipment that's uh, used in, uh, in US and other uh, countries? Uh, the equipment is uh, same, uh, and uh, for example, for example, CBCD is completely same. Uh, but uh, the technique with which uh, uh, X-rays uh, are taken is a little different. So, uh, uh, and over here, a lot of bite wings are taken. That's not common in Pakistan. Uh, uh, in Pakistan, a lot of panoramics are taken. So it's a you know uh, the equipment is uh, similar, uh, but techniques are different. Well, um, it will be interesting uh, years from now that, you know, all these AI models are trained here in U.S. and other developing countries and then just taken as is to other countries so they can be used. So the, we don't need, really need the data from there. All we need is uh, to be able to help and predict because train, the models are already but, trained. But interestingly, my first data actually did come from Pakistan. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, and we got it like very, very quickly. Uh, and our first model started getting trained from there and then we started getting data from here. Very nice. I know a few st healthcare startups that are doing something similar, getting the data from Middle East because it's more open. Trying to get it from Apex in US or from any healthcare system is probably like an, a year of uh, effort uh, compared to in Middle East or in uh, uh, Pakistan or India where it's much, much uh, easier to get access to. Okay, so we have more questions, so that's great. Um, so we have a question from Rahil. He's asking if you can share how research at CSAIL and coursework at MIT help you for this uh, entrepreneurial venture? Yes, yeah, so I think so my research at CISL, which is the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, um, you know, what's really crucial in understanding where AI is, what needs to be built, you know, what are the limitations of AI, um, and, uh, you know, in technology in general, like wh where should we focus on? Um, and uh, so I think, uh, we're, uh, of course, it, it, it had an impact in how I think about what's happening. Also, in, uh, I, I did take a lot of my uh, minor was in uh, entrepreneurial ma management at MIT. So I did uh, every year I took a, um, uh, or every semester I took a management course as well. Uh, so I, I was... Uh, interested in entrepreneurship from the beginning and I was involved in uh, many startups uh, during my time at MIT as well. So I think my coursework is, as well as, uh, uh, you know, having experience uh, uh, at CSIL building products and deploying products really helped out. Great. Yeah, we have a question from Kasim. Uh, he's asking that um, um, for supervised learning, you need a lot of data. Uh, in US, uh, who owns this data? And will it be possible for companies to use customer data to do learning? Yeah, so I think the, the, the good thing is, and I think we, we learned it uh, uh, later than when we started working on this. The good thing is, you know, first the, the, the patient owns the data. Uh, they, you know, the, the dentist gets access to the data, uh, but, you know, they, but uh, it's, a lot of the, the restrictions are around PHI or what's called protected health information, which is uh, the identifiers. 
But if you can strip the data from the identifier, so for example, when it's an image, if I can say, you know, it's a Fahad's image, then I have an issue. But if I can remove uh, Fahad from the image itself, whether it's, if it's been written on it, I can de-identify it or whatever the metadata might be, I, if I can strip it off, then I can get anonymized data. Once I get anonymized data, uh, people do have, um, you know, the, 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 these institutions have, uh, you know, when customers were signing it, they, they said this data could be shared. So uh, uh, in their uh, contracts, uh, they were allowed to share it. So the good thing is we don't have to ask the patients for the data. We can use anonymized data uh, to train our models. And, and the model doesn't care, you know, apart from some, if you wanted to get some demographic information in for some particular aspect, but there are ways to go around it as well. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, even even in being healthcare, if you can remove EHI from the actual data, you, you can uh, uh, use it uh, in in many different ways. So um, follow up to this question: do, When you go to these dental offices, uh, do you go one at a time and ask them that can I have access to your data so I can train the system? And what do you offer them back? How do you uh, uh, incentivize them to give you access to their data? So I think uh, so. First few clinics we went to, we had to ask them for the for their data. Um, uh, uh, so that was uh, uh, we had to convince them this was the great solution. And I and I love to share some of the emails that were sent to me in in terms of uh, them really believing that this is a solution that's going to help uh, the patients and them thanking me for taking their data to uh, help uh, help patients. So I think there was a. Uh, you know, the people we approached were very uh, into uh, helping people and uh, using their data for, for that. Uh, but now we actually, uh, every practice that we install in, uh, in our agreements, uh, we get access to their data. So, you know, um, so we install uh, uh, utilities in uh, den uh, de dentist clinics. They get access to uh, the insights that we're providing, which helps them improve their practices. Uh, we, in turn, get access to their data. Uh, and uh, and they pay for using the solution, so it's 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 free uh, data that we're gathering. Very good. Okay, uh, good question. Um, talking about the branding uh, for the for your company, how do you come up with this name? So it's, uh, it's probably a dentist asking this. If uh, so, it's a it's a dental terminology. Uh, overjet is basically the dis, You know, your there's a distance between your top teeth and your bottom teeth, and that distance uh, for bite to close is called overjet. If it's 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 a lot. Uh, if it's more than two to three millimeters, then it's called uh, you know it's called buck teeth, or your front teeth will be very out. Uh, uh, or if it if it's, but there has to be the specific distance. So for us, you know, it it kind of tells you how. Uh, you know, these distances, et cetera, are very important, which is uh, what we actually focus on, as well as it's the terminology, which we realize that uh, uh, people, uh, your common people then, uh, or non-dentists uh, thought meant uh, futuristic, the, jet, the word jet kind of stands out to them. And dentists always chuckled a little when they heard the term. So it was a term that uh, people had a reaction to, so we actually kept it. Great. Okay, so we are coming to, uh, towards the end now. Um, what are the few things? Um, number one, you know, uh, open organization. Uh, we're very proud of you, and uh, and uh, you know, we, if you need any help from open, uh, whether it's Silicon Valley, and you're already involved with Open Boston for some time now, uh, or Open Global, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. We will be here to help you, whether it's uh, helping you make introductions or in your other rounds. So, and we would love to have you come to our conferences and share your story and journey as you make progress and move from here to next level to next level and so on. Okay. So, you know, you're, you're uh, part of the family and, you know, always feel free to reach out to us. We Thank need, you so much. We need us. Um, any last uh, comments, any last feedback for young, inspiring entrepreneur, one of uh, in, uh, in, uh, inspiring, inspiring, aspiring entrepreneurs? people who have not just ma not made that decision yet to jump into ventures. So any advice for them? I think one major, uh, what I would uh, at least uh, address them is, uh, or say to them is, uh, if there's something that you really want to do, just go for it. You know, you, you'll always have uh, a job 
uh, waiting for you when if, if it doesn't work. But having that opportunity, there's a lot of learning. If it, even if it doesn't work, there's a lot of learning about yourself, about well, you know how do you build startups that uh, that that's you, you, that you're going to have. So I think it's definitely worth it, um, and 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 challenging yourself uh, more than a job would. So I, I would say go for it. Uh, tr- uh, you know, uh, at least uh, if if there's some idea that you're really uh, passionate about. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of resources around. Open is one of them. You know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in the ecosystem that you can talk to as well. Uh, and uh, you know, and uh, using those and and uh, other resources around you to actually uh, build something and see if it uh, if it works. And if not, there is a job that you can always fall back on. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Varda, for joining us and for sharing your story. Um, for all those who uh, uh, joined uh, from all over the world, thank you for doing that. Uh, we have more webinars uh, scheduled for this month and for next month. Uh, if you haven't signed up, please sign up for Open Silicon Valley uh, newsletter. And thank you and have a great weekend. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye.